Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Clinton. I'm an attorney here in Austin, and it is my honor to be the first to welcome you to the seventh annual Aust American Pets Alive conference. Thank you guys so much for coming. And a couple more people are up here with me. I want to introduce Dr. Ellen Jefferson of Austin Pets Alive. And Leanne Cheneville of the uh, Austin Animal Center, the city of Austin. So I got a, a phone call a couple nights ago from a friend of mine who is in another city in Texas. And she had just seen a news, ar a, a news article, on, a, a story on the news, on the local news, about how her shelter was killing 97% of the animals um, that, were, that were impounded. And she was so struck by this um, that she told me that she was in her apartment holding her dog, crying and shaking in anger. And it reminded me of a phone call that I got uh, many years ago from another friend in, in Texas who had uh, been volunteering at a shelter and stumbled upon a cat that was dead in a crate because it had been brought in as a feral and then left outside in the sun for three days, the Texas sun. And that community, by the way, is now a no-kill community. And it reminded me of the story of another woman, a friend of mine in New York, who had uh, volunteered to foster bottle baby kittens. And she had brought the bottle baby kittens home, and she had every four hours fed them, and she had bonded with them, and she had loved them, and she had adored them. And when it was time to bring them back to the shelter to be, uh, to be adopted out, she did. And then one of them got sick, and the director killed all of them without giving her a phone call first. It reminded me of those moments of anger, that moment at which you say enough is enough, that moment that you decide that you're going to be the person in your community that makes a change. And I wonder how many of you have had that moment. I know you guys did. So my moment was the first time that I looked at these statistics. And specifically in 2005, you can see that Austin killed 14,304 animals. That was 1,200 animals a month, 34 animals a day, or one animal every 12 minutes that the shelter was open. There were people whose job it was to kill animals all day long, every day, weekdays, weekends, holidays. That's what they did. But our journey is from that moment to today, from a roughly 60 to 65 percent uh, kill rate when we started this journey, or when I got started getting involved in this journey, to a 98 percent save rate this past year. So the whole purpose of this, this conference and this presentation specifically is to let you know how far we've come and where we are now and what we have left to do. And you are gonna have that same journey in your community and many of you are at different stages in that journey. Some of you are already at 90% 90 90 and you wanna to get to 95. Some of you might be at 95% and you wanna to get to 98. Some of you might be at 5% and wanna to get to 50. We're at different parts in our journey but we're, we're all on the same path. We're all going to make this country a no-kill nation. And the purpose, again, of this conference is to go back and empower you to do this in your community. We are a little bit unlike other nonprofits. We are not asking you to send us your money and then to feel better about it and then to move on and do something else with your lives. Because we know that we're not big enough alone to go out and solve this problem in every community. But what we do have the ability to do is to give each and every one of you the information that you need to go back into, into your community and do it. And you will. You'll have that information at the end of this three days, and you will be able to go back into your community. And I promise you that you will be able to accomplish no kill in your community. So after I saw that, that data back in 2005, you know, I'm a lawyer. I, I had no animal welfare background at all. I had stumbled into this issue after a stray cat uh, 
came up to my front door one day and I had no idea what to do with it. And at, through that learning process, I learned that there were, in fact, other communities that were saving so many animals. And I was shocked that a community like Austin, with a reputation for being so progressive, uh, was killing so many animals. So what I did was I founded, you know, I'm a lawyer, I founded a political advocacy organization. And I decided that what I could bring to this movement was the ability to advocate for animals, to advocate for the solutions uh, that had worked in other communities. So the first thing that we did is we dressed up as cats and locked ourselves in cages in front of City Hall. We did not do this, you guys. There was no laughs in the room. <laughs> this is a publicity stunt. This does not work. We did not do this. <laughs> we looked more like this, OK? Because from day one, our goal was if we were going to achieve results like people who lobby City Hall, we were going to act and look and behave like people who achieve results at City Hall. You wouldn't uh, clean a litter box in a business suit. You don't go to City Hall in sweatpants, OK? Those are two different, two different tasks. So what we wanted to do is look like this. We brought bound, we pr bound printed materials every time that we talked to a city council member. It ha we had charts and graphs and data and statistics. We had the city budget lined up, the save rate, the kill rate, the lack of success and the lack of progression. And this was so powerful that even if we just had 15 or 20 minutes with a council member, they could bring this home, they could sift through it, and they could l begin to learn the data, the actual uh, information that they needed to make decisions. This data was so powerful, by the way, that one city council member that we talked to and left it with was lobbied by another group after we had talked to him a couple days later. And that group gave him some information that he was like, no, I'm not sure that's true. Hold on just a second went back into his desk, pulled out our graphs and charts, flipped it around, sent it to the other side of the table, and the other, other group said, oh, never mind. That's the power of data and professionalism. We also bought full-page advertisements in the newspaper. Like this one, in the 1980s, Al Gore invented a device that can dramatically reduce the killing of Austin's lost and homeless pets, the internet. I don't know how many of you are too young to get that joke, but it seemed <laughs> to be about three quarters of the room. <laughs> there was one time when Al Gore mistakenly said that he had invented the internet. This became a thing. I don't know how many of you don't know who Al Gore is. <laughs> anyway, he's a guy who invented the internet. Um, <laughs> We also engaged in political advocacy. We would interview every city council candidate who we thought had a chance of winning. We would provide questionnaires to the city council members, and we would grade them both on the answers to their questions in our questionnaires and their record if they had any. And we would buy full-page advertisements in the local newspaper, rating them based on how well we thought they had done on our surveys and in their, uh, and, and in their record. Um, one of the things I always love about this slide is Lee Leffingwell was the, was the mayor at the time. And um, uh, Mayor Leffingwell had all, not always exactly been great to us. Um, but we knew he was going to win, so we gave him three and a half paws out of five. And um, he stopped a friend of ours on the street and said, can you believe I got three and a half paws? <laughs> This matters. Believe it or not, this stuff matters. It matters a lot. It will get, nothing will get a politician's attention like being scored poorly on an animal welfare guide published in the newspaper. So what did the political movement do? We informed and engaged the citizens of Austin about shelter issues and the promise that life-saving reforms can bring. We created an enormous base of animal lovers, volunteers, and advocates. We, in fact, didn't know that we were doing that. But that's what we discovered, is that the very uh, core group of volunteers and advocates that we had got, moved into the political campaign then got handed over to Austin Pets Alive to become the, the core group of volunteers that started Austin Pets Alive. And Ellen will talk about that in a sec. We put no-kill on the city's agenda. When we first started uh, calling and emailing city council members, they wouldn't e even meet with us. 
by the end of the, the political campaign, uh, they were calling us on our cell phones when they had questions. They were stopping us in the grocery store when they, when they, when they ran into us. They were running advertisements during their campaign saying that they were the no-kill candidates made a huge difference on the polit city's political agenda. And we helped inform and cultivate the interest of politicians and city leaders on this issue. So what came next? Ellen? After Fix Austin started in 2005, I got involved. I was doing um, spay neuter and started a, a large spay neuter clinic and was thinking that was the way to solve um, the problem. And uh, after almost a decade of doing that, we didn't see a huge reduction in the number of animals coming into the shelter, which was the whole point. And I'm a veterinarian. I wasn't planning to get involved in this at all. I was planning to be private practice veterinarian, and so 10 years out of my career was a long time to not see the results that I was expecting. So um, when I got involved with Austin Pets Alive, it was really at the urging of Fix Austin and seeing that this, we need to do better. We need to do better in the shelter. We're already doing a good job in the community. We need to do better in the shelter. And um, what is important is really understanding the data. So when we were looking at the number of animals that died in 2007, it's just a number. And unless you know what's in that number, you don't really know how to solve for it. So it was really important to understand um, who was dying and why they were dying and when they were dying. And um, it's, it's actually really difficult to get that data. Um, we, had it, we didn't have it all when we started. So we, we actually got this by walking the euthanasia list with the city every day and they would let us choose animals off of it. And then we started figuring out the patterns and then we were able to inform the data um, almost backwards. But this, that kind of data is incredibly powerful, like what Ryan said. Um, so as an animal welfare leader, because of the spay neuter clinic, there was a lot of opposition to going to no-kill. And I'm sure you guys feel this in your community. It's, it is still, um, I think it's getting much more mainstream, but, um, but at first it was really difficult to get everybody on the same page. So even the people that my colleagues and my friends um, were, were not in favor of it. And um, the arguments of there's too many animals and not enough homes, if you, if you take a dollar away from spay neuter, then you're getting further behind the problem and it's going to spiral out of control. Um, the animals that were dying are not adoptable, is what we were told also. Um, the community has to solve it. There's too, much, too many irresponsible people in our community, and unless you solve that through education, it's never going to get better at the shelter. And, and there was a lot of infighting, so people couldn't even decide if we would call it no-kill or less kill or humane community or whatever. And it, you know, instead of getting the work done, we were arguing about semantics. Um, so the thing that turned me, I was obviously a huge spay-neuter um, advocate, and the thing that turned me was the data around um, pets. And the Association of Veterinary, uh, or the American Veterinary Medical Association publishes information every year about uh, what households are doing. It's for their, their the practices, um, when they're starting a practice, to know how many pets are in their community so they know if they have a business or not for veterinarians. And in Austin, it was estimated that 75,000 people had a pet under the age of one year, which meant they got it in the last year. And we also knew that only 25 to 30 percent of animals were coming from rescue groups and shelters. So to me, that was not, um, not enough homes. We clearly have enough homes. If for 14,000 animals dying in our community, it was that we weren't getting our animals into those homes. And so that becomes a marketing problem, not a overpopulation problem. These are the animals in 2007, and I think, you know, any community can probably um, uh, commiserate with this, but this is, it, it, pretty much nobody was safe. Um, there, it was only 45% save rate, so every type of animal was at risk, um, even some of the most adoptable. But by 2017, because of the work that we've done, really focusing on the data and focusing on these groups of animals, we now have a community that is safe for all cats, all kittens, all dogs, and all cats. And I put the big dogs separately because we still have a group of animals that don't have a safe place to go if they're demonstrably, demonstrably dangerous to the community. We still don't have a live outcome for those, but it's very small, like 2% of our dog population. Um, so, because data is so important, it's really, and we'll talk about data in the next one, but um, in the next session, 
But what we're trying to capture with this graph is that by being able to pull our, our, um, our model is pulling the animals off the euthanasia list because we didn't want to duplicate anybody's effort. So if the Humane Society was pulling animals or a rescue group was pulling animals or people were adopting, we didn't want to take an animal that they might take. So by looking only at the ones at the end of the line, we knew that whatever was already out the door was out the door and this was what was left. And so we were able to calculate by pulling animals off the euthanasia list a percent increase in the save rate for that day, for that week, for that month, and, it, and it's reliable. So, and even now we know what our, what our impact is on our city save rate. And that's very powerful for fundraising, it's very powerful for politics, um, it's important. I mean, obviously it's important, all the animals need to get out. And so, um, and so I like this because it shows exactly the impact. Um, so as I was saying that we focused on the euthanasia list and that is probably the most important thing that we, most important decision that we made right off the bat with Austin Pets Alive. And, um, and then once we found out who was dying, there was a large number of animals that were just dying because they were um, not, didn't have enough time. Um, the shelter, you know, by law would only give them three days and then they had to turn over the cages for incoming animals. And, um, but then we found a whole other group of animals that were more needy and needed something done to them before they could get out and be adopted. And so those are the ones that we've built our safety nets around and what Austin Pets Alive specializes in and makes our community whole is by providing those safety nets. Um, and so in addition to all the good work that is happening in the community, every animal has a way out. Every animal has a path to get out of the shelter alive. And um, I can't, uh, overstate that. And the other thing that we did is we didn't have any money when we started. We had no money, we had no staff, we had no facility, and so we were 100% volunteer based. And, it, and so we had to leverage the community, but I think that in order to solve this problem, this problem is not on any one person's shoulders, it is the whole community's problem. And so you need the community to be part of the solution. You need people to come forward and volunteer and foster and be part of it because um, everybody plays a part. The animals didn't get there by one person. They all come in one by one person at a time, and so we need to counter that by one person at a time getting them out. So I, I like this because it shows um, kind of what, what we were doing. On the left where the blue is, is um, the animals that, like half of that spectrum, if on the end of the blue, if we have a Yorkie, you know, purebred Yorkie that is perfectly healthy, that dog probably has a live outcome, and um, that would be on that spectrum down there, on the end of that spectrum. On this side is your um, incontinent aggressive pit bull, and that is really hard to save. And, um, and so we were right in the middle. So we were saving pretty much all the animals that had fast turnover, low cost, and the way that Austin Pets Alive inserted ourselves is that we would only look at what was on this side. So if the city started doing a better job with adoptions, which they did, and Leanne will talk about the amazing strides that the city has made, then as they moved further, if they, as they got bigger chunks of the left side solved, then we would keep moving down because we were focused only on the euthanasia list. So together, we were able to get the whole spectrum done. And, um, and so now we're at a place 98%, which would be know right here which is pretty exciting and um, most cities get stuck around 70 to 80 percent because they don't develop those specialty programs to get the animals to have that live outcome for the animals that aren't readily adoptable immediately and so it, at some point somebody has to focus on that whether it's the municipal shelter or a nonprofit somebody has to focus on those animals or you'll never get to the high 90s or even 90 and I'll turn it over to Leanne I have been assured that I have some uh, important information to be able to share with you all as you <laughs> embark on your uh, no-kill journey. I'm new to Austin. I've only been here about two and a half years. Um, however, when I started, we still had a, you know, by our city council mandate, which was passed in, in 2010, that required the city to, city shelter to achieve 90% live outcomes. We were doing pretty successfully. We were consistently in the low 90s and had, had been for about six years. As Ryan mentioned this morning, we are now uh, pushing 98%. So we, we made a pretty big jump uh, still. Thank you. 
Um, so we've, we've still made significant strides uh, quite recently. And the way we've done that is by focusing on programs that have live outcomes. So when we are um, thinking about what we do in our shelter, we put our resources and our focus into making sure that the animals have some kind of outcome. Um, and we try not to get just distracted by sort of other noise um, and, and other others' um, priorities. So as Ellen said, um, we have, I think, doubled our adoptions in the last eight years. Uh, we've done that through a number of strategies. Uh, one was just embracing that open adoption model. Um, your community should be uh, who determines what animals are adoptable or not. And when you start loosening some of your restrictions around ideas about what healthy or behaviorally um, challenged animals uh, fit in people's homes, you can really um, improve your, your live release rate. Um, it's also important to uh, work social media and marketing to your advantage. As Ellen said earlier, there was a huge marketing problem in the city um, with uh, promoting its, its animals. Um, so using social media to tell those, those positive stories is extremely important. Um, one of the things that people frequently actually ask me about uh, social media is how, how to use it effectively. And really, it's just use it to tell your story, tell it in a positive way, and tell your community exactly what you're, what you're looking for. Um, the other significant um, program is our, is our foster program. So right at the beginning of uh, Austin's No Kill Journey, we didn't have much of a foster program to speak of. It was only employees who were allowed to, to foster animals. And for any of you who are struggling with outdated um, shelters that don't um, facilitate good veterinary practices and you're concerned about disease outbreaks, or um, facilities that, that aren't as, as welcoming as you might like. The shelter is a very, very dangerous place for animals, um, both in terms of promoting uh, stress behaviors and uh, potentially for um, disease that you may not have the resources to treat. So they're, they're safer in a home. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to involve your community in promoting those animals and involving your community and finding placement options. Um, one of the big game changers, I think, for Austin in the last two years was really putting a lot of uh, focus on expanding our large dog foster programs. So still for many uh, locations in the, or excuse me, many shelters in the country um, do not, for various reasons, have robust large dog foster programs. And as Ellen said, that is one of the populations that's still uh, most at risk in many, many communities. Um, we also have a number of uh, specialty foster uh, programs. So we have fosters who uh, commit to uh, finding placement for animals themselves, and then we also have fosters that just commit to us on short term. So this summer we launched a pretty successful uh, summer camp for dog program, uh, which helped, uh, or where we asked our community to, to give dogs a summer vacation from the shelter for two weeks. Um, so again, that goes back to thinking about, uh, <laughs> so like, thinking back to that, that positive uh, messaging, that was really important for us this summer because we were at capacity. Um, and having uh, dogs in, in crates in a multi-purpose room is not really an ideal situation for everyone, but getting them into a, a home for a break is. So, um, but sometimes your community will get burned out on some of that um, emergency language, but something like summer camp is, is much more fun. Also, uh, one of Austin uh, Animal Center's most important programs, I think, is our animal protection program. Um, so in, in uh, many, if not most, communities, animal control is not thought of as being a uh, key driver of life-saving. Um, but for us, it's an important program to make sure that we are only bringing the animals into the shelter that are most in need of the shelter's resources. Even in communities um, like Austin that has a fairly well-funded animal services office and we have a large, uh, robust nonprofit, 
the local government will never have all of the resources to be able to solve all animal issues or really all community issues um, by itself. So with our engagement-based uh, program, we're really focusing on working with the community to build capacity and keep animals in homes um, with owners who by and large take pretty good care of them and, and love them. Um, and we connect them with resources if all they need is a, is a little bit more assistance. Um, one of the other uh, key features of our program is really, what's going on? Um, it's really about using animal protection to promote sort of our ethic of life saving in the community and we extend that to wildlife as well. Um, in a perfect world these wouldn't be birds, these would be you know coyotes and, and skunks. Um, but it's really about helping the community learn um, to uh, solve animal related um, issues on its, on its own. And then you'll also um, see we're doing a, a microchip um, pop-up clinic the other important part of um, keeping animals who don't need to be in the shelter out is uh, through return and field and making sure our officers stay in the community engaging uh, with residents so we can get dogs back home again. Um, we also no longer uh, call our intake facility an intake facility, we call it a pet resource center. Um, going back to what I mentioned earlier about telling your story, um, we really, we're continuing to re-message to the community about what our role is. And as I said, our role is really about being a partner and helping uh, the community um, resolve issues. And we have resources that we can connect people with, but we don't have all those resources ourselves. So Pet Resource Center focuses on keeping animals um, in homes, um, working to sort of resolve nuisance behavior, um, one of the other terms that we did away with was owner surrender, so we only talk about a rehoming process. And for some animals, the best option for them to be rehomed is going to be coming into the shelter, um, but through implementing appointment-based uh, surrender programs, we try to involve owners in the, um, the rehoming process. So again, it's about helping your community understand that um, it's, a, it's a partnership in resolving those issues. And then at the end of the day, if you feel overwhelmed, which I'm sure that we, we all do, and I feel overwhelmed sometimes, but it's important to remember it's a team effort. As Ellen and Ryan both said, if you ask your community for help, um, they, they will find ways to step up and help you. I know that's a very scary uh, feeling sometimes, and we can all probably come up with examples of when um, a person or a group of people has not been uh, easy to work with. But those um, figures, those um, data points that we achieved in 2017 was truly a community effort. Um, we set record adoption numbers. It was over 8,000 animals uh, that were adopted. Um, over 3,000 uh, pets returned to the owners. And we're pushing a 98% um, save rate at our shelter. And that's through a, the partnership between the city and our nonprofit, it's um, through our community that steps up and supports us as volunteers and uh, fosters and people who, if they can't do either of those, share um, uh, promotions and things on, on social media. So I find this to be very reassuring at the end of the day. And, and Leanne won't say it, but I, but I do think it needs to be pointed out, which is that um, we get a, those of us who have been in it a long time um, get a lot of the credit for it. And Austin Pets Alive deservingly uh, gets a lot of the credit for Austin being uh, the largest no-kill city in the nation. But we absolutely would not be, but for the commitment and the work and the and the passion of the people at Austin Animal Center. And so they deserve an enormous thank you. So this might be what it seems like. You know, it sounds like we just went from A to B uh, so quickly and directly. But as Ellen points out, it looked a, more like, a lot more like this. There probably should be squiggly circles all over the place. I should have probably brought one of my child's drawings to make it look like our, our path. But we really did. We planned it out to the, at the beginning. We moved in the direction of saving lives. And we got to this outcome that we're so proud of. Um, 
So there are a couple of things that we wanted to leave you with. Um, the first is mind the gap. Uh, what we want you to do, one of the things we want you to do when you go home is figure out what the programs are in your community and then uh, figure out what's not being implemented because that is the, probably the most important question that you can ask yourself. What programs have we not implemented and how can we implement them as quickly as possible? So mind the gap in life saving. Figure out what the gaps are. Figure out what the holes in life saving are. Identify the animals that are still being killed and then develop a program to save them. It's the programs. Number two, it is the programs. We talk so much about, and I, you know, in, in animal welfare, if you go to almost any other conference, they're talk, gonna talk about how important collaboration is, how, how important it is that we all get along. I don't believe in any of that stuff. I don't care if you don't like me at all. If you implement the programs, you're gonna save lives. It doesn't matter if people like you. In fact, there's tons of people that don't like us. Who cares? If there are groups that are saving lives, empower them. If there are more programs that can save lives, empower the people that can put those programs together. If there's a group already in your community that is saving a certain type of animal, thank them and then go save another type of animal that is not being saved. So we don't all have to get along, we don't all have to, get to be best friends, but if we're implementing the right programs, then we're gonna get to no-kill. And Ellen's gonna talk in the next session about a 12-point programmatic recipe. Mantra number three. It can be done because it's being done. Something cannot be both impossible and already being accomplished. When we started this journey in Austin, there were two no-kill communities in America. There were four by the time we finished, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds now, okay? It's already being done all across the country. It's being done in poor cities, in small cities, in rural cities, in big cities, in rich cities, in large cities. There's not a type of city in the entire United States that is not already no-kill. So there's nothing in your community that is so unique that it will prevent you from accomplishing what we've accomplished here. Before I get to the last slide, I want to tell you some, uh, about an article that I read last night. Sorry, Ellen. It was an article about Elon Musk and his thinking. And if anybody doesn't know who he is, he's the guy who founded Tesla, and he's the guy that just shot one of his Teslas to Mars this week. Okay? And one of the things that he just decided one day is that he wanted to build a rocket ship to Mars. He wanted to fly a rocket ship to Mars. And so um, the first thing he did was he went to his engineers and said, hey, you know, what do we do to build a rocket ship? And they said, well, you need to go buy one. And it was $95 million. And that was a little bit out of sight of the budget that he had at the time. So he decided, well, maybe I can go uh, refurbish a used ballistic missile from Russia. So he flew to Russia, and he met with the Russian government, and they said they quoted him a price of $22 million for a used ballistic missile. Well, he didn't really have $22 million at the time either. So he simply asked himself, well, what are the ingredients of a rocket ship? And he figured out that he could buy all of the... Uh, all of the metals and all of the ingredients to build a rocket ship for a small fraction of the price that he was being quoted on the market. And he could do this at a tiny fraction of the cost. And the article talked about this type of thinking where you abandon all of the, the, the voices in your head that say it can't be done. And you get rid of all of the voices you, in your head that blame someone else or say someone else is in the way or say it can't happen and you get rid of all the thinking that other people have told you are the ways that you solve a problem. Because everybody had said, well, you gotta go buy a rocket. That's how you get to Mars. Or everybody said, you gotta go buy a used missile. That's how you get to Mars. Well, he abandoned all of that. And that's what we've done in No Kill Too. That's what we've done in our programs because the question that Ellen asked herself was not, what is the solution that everybody else has already come up with, which we already know is spay-neuter, right? That was the solution we were already told, all taught all our lives. Instead, she said, let's look at the data and figure out the ingredients of no-kill. And the ingredients of no-kill are these programs that Ellen and others have come up with to get us from killing animals to saving animals. The fastest way to save an animal is to save the animal. And it's something that this movement 
has only recently caught on to for some reason. <laughs> Figure out a way to save the animal that's in front of you. For far too long, we have believed that it was ethical to turn our backs on the animals that were already in the shelter in order to save animals 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years later. And what Ellen said is, I'm not willing to turn my back on the animals that are here today. We're going to figure out how to build a rocket ship from the ingredients. And that's pretty awesome. So thank you, Ellen, for doing that. <laughs> Two last things. Um, uh, the University of Denver did an economic study because one of the things you'll hear about Austin, no doubt, is that, well, they just spent so much money on it. We just don't have the money. But it turns out that the uh, investment that Austin has made in no-kill has turned a $157 million profit by building uh, in economic development in the community. So anytime you hear a city council tell you, well, we're just not, we don't have the money to spend on that, you need to send them this economic development um, uh, report that shows that for every dollar you put in to no-kill, you're going to get many, many dollars back in your community. Also, the next, what is our next step in addition to doing uh, the annual uh, conference that you're attending now? We are also developing two, two more things. The Maddie's Life Saving Academy, which is up and running, and I believe there, there's going to be a booth or is already a booth outside. The Maddie's Life Saving Academy is going to bring people from other communities into Austin for longer term commitments to learn the day by day, step by step work that we do so that you can bring that back into your community. And then second, Maddie's, the Life Singing Academy is also, again, already up and running, um, going to be willing to hire experts from our community to go to your community to work with you, to train you in your community. Again, this is not about where our, our nonprofit is not about you writing us a check and then, not and then not feeling guilty about killing anymore and then going home. Our nonprofit is about empowering you to go be a soldier in this, in this war on killing and to go into your community and save them yourself. So you got this. You can do this. Thank you for coming. We can't wait to see you this weekend. <laughs>